evening. Uh, on behalf of the cataloging committee, welcome to the January 2023 Missouri Evergreen Cataloging meeting. Um, I hope everyone had good holidays and stayed healthy. I know that was probably <laughs> pretty hard for, for a lot of us. Staying healthy throughout the holidays is hard. Um, just going to jump right into it. Um, I'll tell you guys about what the cataloging committee has been doing lately. Um, just our usual reminder, the Evergreen Users Conference is coming up in April. It will be here before you know it. Um, it will be in Columbia uh, in the Mornet meeting rooms. Um, April 13th and 14th, right, Mickey? Yes, okay. Um, the event is going to be hybrid, so um, if you can't make it to Columbia, we are going to try to do our programs uh, online as well. Uh, we do hope that you try to come and uh, join us, though. It would be so nice to see everyone's faces, and we're going to have some great programs and great training, um, so that's exciting. Uh, and there will be cataloging programs to be determined what they are, but we will be offering them for sure. Um, in the email reminder uh, for the meeting that I sent out this morning, um, the piracy policy was attached. This is the policy that uh, we will be presenting to the general membership in the February meeting. Um, and then once it's adopted, we will get it posted to our cataloging uh, page on the Missouri Evergreen website. So if you want to take a look over that, please feel free. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight some of the great listserv discussions that we've had over the last month. Um, one thing that was brought to the forefront that everybody should always have in the back of their mind is to check that 300 field, that physical description field. It is uh, one of the fields that is most often um, ha it has a high probability, maybe not probability, but um, it can be in the page numbers, especially can be incorrect a lot of the time because um, that mark record may have been created before uh, the item was actually published. So um, when you get that item in hand, check that 300 field uh, versus what's in your hand and make sure that those page numbers uh, match up. We all know in the long run that's going to help us catalogers big time because that helps us determine uh, merging and um, having good records in Missouri Evergreen. Um, something else that I just uh, reminded everyone about is on sale dates. We all know that Spare comes out tomorrow and everybody's on pins and needles to hear about the royal tea. Um, but uh, do not put it out on your shelves until tomorrow. And that's just one example of, uh, you know, books that those of us uh, that maybe have standing orders or, you know, even firm orders or whatever, we have the books in our hands before uh, they're actually set to go live on the street. So don't put them out until that day. And then the one of the last things I wanted to highlight uh, a discussion that we had on the listserv was uh, uniform titles and variant titles. So a uniform title is a 240 and a variant title is a 246. Um, and the question was, is this correct in a 240 field? And so Liz explained to us that uniform titles are used to link together bib records that have been previous, previously published under another title uh, or with another work. Um, so the 240 is a searchable field the 245 is still going to display um, as the title for our patrons, um, but uh, the 240 means that this was published as something different at one time or with a different piece of work at one time versus a 246, which is a variant title, which could mean a lot of different things. Um, like it could be a portion of a title or if the cover title might be different than the, the title page, which as you know, we, we catalog from the title page, not the cover, um, and, or spelling out things. Um, yes, Missouri Evergreen or Evergreen ILS, it can tell the, the number four versus the spelled out four, um, but 
catalogers generally we will give it a 246 and spell that out because sometime down the line you might be in an ILS that that can't decipher those two things so um, it's just good practice to to do that so uh, 246s are I like to think of it as a title that my patron could somehow have gotten their hands on that they would be looking up this, this item so if it's going to help my patrons uh, find the title, then I'm probably going to put it in a 246 somehow. Um, remember that uh, a 240 can always be a 246 because again, it might be something that your patron searches for, but a 246 most likely won't usually be a 240. So um, a 240 can be a 246, but a 246 usually won't be a 240 always. Um, so any questions about that? or any of that. Liz, our consortium cataloger, is going to catch us up on what she's been doing the last month. OK, hello, hello. Um, so cataloging surveys, of course, I turned that off. I got everyone's responses. We had a great response rate, guys. We had uh, 60 responses. So thank you, thank you to everyone who took the time to fill that out. Um, we appreciate the time you had to take to do that. And um, even if you know you just checked a box or you wrote us a paragraph, we appreciate it. So we are taking that into account when we're making decisions going forward. Um, there were you know lots of common questions and concerns in these that you know we are you know acknowledging and talking about on the back end, um, including things like will the certification and the documentation be updated because it currently doesn't match like the picture like it looks slightly different yes um the test server has been updated to 3.9 um the regular server has not but as we move forward things will be updated uh what will the certification process look like you know in 2024 uh to be determined we're talking about that um are we going to stick with videos and uh, the papery version, you know, that we're going to walk along with, or are we going to do something else? Um, so we'll keep you updated. But know that we have heard you, and we are taking these things to town. Um, so going forward, um, the discussions have really opened up, and right now they're leading us to talk about regional training. So where will regional training be? I have made a beautiful map that I have not shared yet because the places are kind of up in the air. We're still talking to some libraries, but we're aiming on four to five locations for regional training that will uh, cover the you know, entire state, but give good overlap. Um, so that some people, if they miss the one that's like kind of close to them, there's one that's also kind of close to them. Um, so that's going to be coming out in the next couple months. Um, I've reached out to some of the libraries, not all of them. Um, possible dates. Dates are still to be determined. Um, we've been discussing doing Fridays, though, because I feel like with the CERC training, the Friday worked out really well, um, since it will be an all-day kind of training, like in the morning and then a break for lunch and then a little bit in the afternoon. Um, and I'm really toying with, uh, can we get all of these done before summer reading? would be nice. I know that throws in a hindrance to a lot of people. Um, so maybe we're going to try. We'll see. And then as for all the other trainings that will be on Zoom, and if people want to sign up for one-on-ones, I am looking again at the survey results for those, and I will have those coming up. And hopefully those will vary by time and date and whatever we have. So uh, other than that, um, I put <laughs> Wonder Books and Vox Books on the agenda, I have put up another uh, template in the test server, not the real server this time. Just if you wanna look at it, please log into the test server and have a look. This is the second go around I've had with making this one uh, because these are gross. I, I put a sad face next to it on the agenda because they're gross, I hate them. <laughs> um, if you've done them, God bless you. It's like, I thought a play away was bad when I used to have to do play ways and then these things exist and now I don't even know what to say. Uh, so I toyed with it again. I don't really like the icons that are coming up. Uh, currently we have an icon for, I think it is, let me think. 
preloaded audio and e-audio is what comes up. And I don't like that combo. I don't think it's quite right. Um, in a perfect world, what would I pick? Maybe we would have its own icon or maybe a book in you know, preloaded audio. No, no, but I don't like what it's giving me right now. Um, so if you have a horse in this race and care about how these things are done, please log on to the test server, give it a look and say, you know, if you have no opinion, great. If you really hate it or really like it, please let me know. Um, Cause that's happening too. And very slowly in the background, cause they're just, they're awful. Um, and then something else I wanted to mention um, over the break. And I say break because, you know, over the holidays when libraries are closed or people are off or they're generally just less people around because they're also the patrons are doing things. Um, I was working on some authority work. So if you did see that in the background happening, saw little changes along with the load, that was just me. Um, I was uh, merging some things that were duplicates of us and working in the authorities. I did not get very far, but every little bit helps, right? Um, so that's what I have been up to. Thanks, Liz. Anyone have a question about any of what Liz talked about? Uh, we're all looking forward to regional trainings. And um, I personally am very glad that she's looking at Wonder Books because when we started to get them in, my eyes started to cross and I didn't know what was up and what was down and what was right. So um, I'm glad to have another uh, brain on it. And then, yeah, authority work. Um, there's a lot of duplicates in there. So um, getting that done is going to be a never ending process, I'm, I'm sure. Hey, there's a question in the chat. Thank you. Let's see. Are you saying, Liz, are you saying that we all have to recertify with each new MEG version? No. That's actually a question that has come up. And the, the question is, do we all have to recertify if we've already done? And we're leaning towards no, but officially, I don't know. But if you've already been, you know, Oh, you mean the you mean the yeah. version of each? Oh, God no! Oh, God no! <laughs> yeah, that every time we upgrade, everyone. no, but you you won't have to uh, recertify every time we upgrade the ILS. Uh, no, hopefully but, we will be upgrading the ILS every year. Um, so, but as far as when we all recertify in general, uh, we're revisiting that as well. So, so it, right now it stands at every two years and we're talking about whether everybody has to do it or the people who've already done it will have to, we don't know, that's a question mark. But every time the system updates, no, that's just, I need to go in and make sure the pictures match what you're looking at. Otherwise it gets very confusing. Um, and the certification was done, I don't know how many updates ago. So at this point, some of the pictures are very much not the same. Yeah, some of those pictures are before we even uh, got ported over to Angular, so they could be very different, unfortunately. So that's definitely something that uh, we will be updating. Thank you for pointing out that question. Any Anyone else have any questions? And questions can be put in chat or asked at any time. Please feel free. Uh, Sean says most of the videos are almost impossible to follow. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, we will be working on, um, you know, the certification process in general. Uh, will all the videos be redone? I don't know. Will we uh, be making new videos? I don't know. Will we be doing videos? I don't know. Um, but we, we're going to try to figure something out. Um, we... We, we, I feel like we were pretty successful with this very first year of certification. Um, we were super happy that we had so many participants. Um, uh, but it was a, it was a first try, and now we know um, where we started, and now we've got somewhere to go from there. So um, it will definitely be um, visited again. You know, looked at again. Yeah, yeah, I had. There was a significant upgrade in and changes in the section that really threw the videos off. Sorry, I'm. I'm not going to say confident. We had a change sheet. Sorry, I'm trying to find. 
I would just say, yeah, yeah, for me, as anyone who's any type of a visual learner, if you're trying to follow along, if it doesn't match what you're looking at, you immediately think, I've done something wrong. This isn't how it's supposed to look. I've gone astray. Um, so that's really an issue. And that yeah, is something that will have to be, you know, addressed every time that it's updated by like me. But yeah, it was amazing that I had I had sat in on the training for the the second one and was able to follow through. And then one of my employees went and did it like three months later, just after the last update. And just they, they literally just looked at it and was like, none of this follows like it was changed that significantly. So and unfortunately, whenever it comes to me, like, oh, how do I do that? Because I only do it once every every month or so like i it, it's almost a day long process to just remember how to how to do certain things whether that's you know what what numbers to put where and all that sort of stuff yeah that's definitely understandable um just know that like liz said we got great feedback uh in the surveys and, and we will be working on it Cheryl says she's going to start training a coworker how to basic catalog. What processes does she take to get basic certification now? Is it the same basic test we just used and email it to Liz? Yeah. For yeah. now, we're going to keep with with the the certification that we have on the website and uh Liz will be the one that will be looking over them and and uh, getting with the cataloger going over it with them and stuff. Great question. Thanks Cheryl. And as always, if you have someone going through these and they are really struggling, they can reach out to me before they submit, you know, their work and we can, you know, kind of go through some things via Zoom and I can talk to them about cataloging. It doesn't have to be just when the test is turned in and then, you know, because I know that stresses some people out. So keep that in mind. You guys can always reach out. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and move along. Um, just a reminder that all of our meetings are on the Missouri Evergreen meeting calendar here. Um, so even, even the connection information. So if you click on there, the Zoom meeting is there. I will always try to send out a reminder um, with the connection information, but all Missouri Evergreen meetings are going to be on this meeting calendar. And um, the Evergreen Cataloging Interest Group, which is the wider Evergreen uh, community, not just Missouri Evergreen, their cataloging meetings are usually the day after ours, the second Tuesday of the month. This month it has been rescheduled to next Tuesday. Um, and it just so happens that uh, myself and Mary Llewellyn, who is the database manager at Bibliomation next month, or no, next week, this month, we are doing a presentation on Mark Edit, which is a very robust free Mark editing program. So um, if you have heard about Mark Edit, um, and if you do any kind of batch editing or are interested in that, um, it might be something that you are uh, could be, could benefit you if you want to sit in on that. If you have any questions about Mark Edit, you can go ahead and ask Liz or I, um, or email it to Cat Help. Um, if you're not familiar with it at all, you, you might not ever need it, but um, we, uh, it, it is very powerful and can be helpful. So, and the, um, I'm going to put that link in the chat. So the Evergreen, all of the Evergreen groups have uh, wikis and all of their meeting things can be found here. Okay, um, at, sticking with the Evergreen uh, community at large, the International Evergreen Conference is April 26th through 29th in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, which is outside of Boston. Um, early bird registration is now open. Um, there are grants out there that you could potentially look for um, to uh, ha help you pay for a, uh, a conference like this. 
Um, this conference, as always, is super helpful. It's such a good conference and everything that you learn, you will be able to go to work the next week and um, apply what you just learned. So it's a great conference and uh, some someday you should consider going. Maybe not this year, but uh, maybe some year think about putting in a Show Me Steps grant or something like that to attend a conference like this. Uh, Liz and I both will be going this year and I'm sure there's other um, Missouri Evergreeners that will be there as well. All right. So now we're gonna talk about um, on order bibs. Uh, so as some of you, as you know, some of the libraries in Missouri Evergreen, they put on order mark records in the system. Um, so this could be six months in advance. This could be a year out in advance. And these are usually these bib records are records that we get from our vendors. Um, and so they could potentially be very good. More than likely, they're not going to be great, though. The reason that we put on order bib records in our system is um, so our patrons can put holds on them as, as soon as they can. You know, um, you know how our patrons are. They they want what they want and they want it right now. So um, having those on order bibs in there helps uh, our in staff be able to help our patrons, and they can put holds on those. Now, with that, it kind of complicates it for us as catalogers. Um, it kind of can make it confusing as to, um, can I add to this bib record? Can I do anything to this bib record? And the ultimate answer is, of course, yes, please do. So um, we are trying to come up with something that would make these records stand out a little more. Um, and the committee is still kind of in talks about how to do that, but we're leaning towards um, altering the 245 maybe to have uh, the title fully capitalized if it's uh, an on order bib record. And then that would kind of signify to the cataloger, um, hey, this bib record is was put in as an on order bib record. It could be um, very stripped. It could It could be not a full record. And then um, we, whomever gets the, the item for the first time when they have item in hand, they will edit that bib record and then, you know, change the title so it looks normal. And then that, that way we know that the bib record is good to go then. So they would then change that capital to sentence case. Now this is still um, in talks, you know, the, the point is we're hoping that this helps not you know, we, we want to be less confusing to our catalogers. Um, so, you know, if you have feedback about us doing something like that, um, we would love to hear it. Um, but we want people to realize that, uh, yes, this is a record that was put in before we had item in hand. So you, if you have that item in hand, please, yes, do edit this bib record and um, you are free to do so. Um, it, if you have, we're trying to prevent um, somebody getting an item in and they see it, they see the title in the, the catalog perhaps, but it doesn't exactly match what they have in hand. So they add a new record and um, we don't want that. We want it, uh, we want them to edit the record that's already in there and then add their item to that one. Um, because of course, uh, what we're all fighting always is duplication in our catalog. So um, that's what we're trying to help with that. One of, the good, one of the good ways that stands out, I know for me, whenever I add an item I, uh, or a record like this, I will also add an old order and my barcode will be in all caps on order and you know information yeah making the item making your holding look kind of look different i think those of us that put on order records in i think we all use this practice where you know uh somewhere in the the call number and the the barcode um it says on order that way you know that um those are not we don't have them in yet we we put this bib in previously. So that's a great point, Ben. 
And that's that's another point. If you're adding a holding that you don't physically have, don't use a barcode that would be your normal barcode in circulation. Yeah, you could use that, but put the own order in all caps to, to distinguish that this doesn't physically exist in the system yet. Yeah. That it's just a holding place. So though, that's something that we've been talking about in the committee and um, doing something to help our catalogers out. Um, I wanted to uh, bring to light some of the new subject headings that have been approved by the, pow the cataloging powers that be. Um, these lists will be uh, sent out. They'll be linked in the uh, minutes when we send them out. But um, some things of note that we're excited about are um, as a subject heading and a genre form, manga has been uh, authorized. Um, as a genre, large print books has been authorized. Before it was always large type books. I feel like large print books is something that people use um, more easily than large type books. So I think that that made a lot of sense to do. Um, a couple uh, more genres that were approved were queer fiction, and there were several new um, sex role uh, genres that were approved, several new sor sexual orientation heading headings like bisexual fiction, er aromantic fiction, and transgender fiction. There's There were lots of those in this list. Um, there were new film headings like zombie films and werewolf films and ghost films. These are, remember, these are all descriptive tags that are gonna help our patrons find what they're looking for. Um, one change of note is that the um, term Eskimos was taken out of the terminology altogether and replaced with um, more specific tribes, uh, Inuit tribes. So um, look for that. And just a reminder as well that Mark Edit, not Mark Edit, I'm sorry, Mark Ive, our authority vendor, on the back end, they make all these changes for us on a monthly basis. So this is not something that we have to physically go and change. Mark, uh, Mark Ive will change these for us. But just remember when you're cataloging that some of those things um, that you're used to maybe using um, aren't authorized any longer. Any questions about, and, and I certainly didn't mention the whole list. I mean, there's literally hundreds of items that were either changed or added. So like I said, those lists will be uh, sent out in the uh, minutes. And um, those are also, anybody can receive those lists. They, they're from, uh, you can get them from various different places, but I get them from class web. Um, so that might be something that we put, now that I think about it, we should put together to, uh, so you can go see those changes that were adopted. Any just, questions about that? I just put the link in the chat. Thank um, you. For everybody if you wanna go look at the list. Um, and just so you know, I don't know if people, like when Kate and I, or both of us, whoever talks about this, this is way above our pay grade. This is not us making these changes. <laughs> this is LOC and um, we just do what they tell us. Yeah, we, we work with, uh, uh, you know, authorized headings, just like anyone else. We are dictated by, um, you know, cataloging is very detailed and it's dictated by Library of Congress, what we do. That period goes right there and that colon goes right there and that subject heading is the one that you have to use. So, yes, definitely above our pay grade. Okay, one last thing that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions about anything, please feel free to uh, just pipe up or put it in the chat. So um, right before this meeting, actually, uh, there was an email sent out to the listserv that was a great email that illustrated exactly what um, I had been planning on talking about anyway. So um, that age old thing in Missouri Evergreen cataloging is parts. It's not something that uh, is new to us discussing, but um, I feel like I was in a meeting last week with Mickey and he said something about, cause somebody was worried about um, being redundant, you know? And uh, he said, 
bring, bring it on essentially he's like the way you learn is just to hear something or do something over and over and over and um i will never stop talking about parts because um it seems to be a, an issue that people have trouble coming to terms with and understanding so um if you get parts and you're good to go, I'm super happy for you, but we are always going to be talking about parts because they are confusing to some people. So um, the example that was sent out to the listserv this morning um, happened to be Top Gun Maverick. So um, she says, uh, you know, I was putting a hold on this for my patron and there are parts on this. Uh, why are there parts? Because it's only one disc. And if you scroll down here, you can see that um, and as always, this is not a call out to any specific library. This is, we're all learning about this together. Um, they put parts in. And the main thing about parts, why we do parts, why we use parts, why we don't use parts in certain um, situations, it all comes down to placing holds for our patrons. We want our patrons to be able to place a hold on exactly what they want um, as easily as possible. So. Um, not only does um, this bib record with the one disc, it shouldn't have a part, the way that the parts were used in this, I can see I, it makes perfect sense why a library would you know, want to note this for themselves somehow, but the parts field is not how to do it. So um, in, I'll just use mine here as an example. Um, if I, you know, if I wanted to note that this was my second copy of this item, then I would use an item note here or something that can be displayed, uh, just like parts are displayed to the public, item notes can be made public as well, or they can just be uh, for your staff. So that is how I would use, if I wanted to note something about mine specifically, um, that is where I would do that because when I'm putting a hold on this item, um, let's see. This is my maintenance card. Um, it's going to ask me about parts here. And if you don't pick one, it's going to go all wonky. And um, when someone has a part and someone doesn't have a part, then holds are targeted differently you know if you put a if you put a hold on any part then it's not going to target the ones that do have holds if you put a, a hold on, and you have chosen a part it's only going to pull holds from items that have that nope nope that's wrong sarah sorry no go ahead <laughs> something i did it um, it's only going to pull holds from parts from for items that are designated with that part. So um, we want to use parts um, correctly because it all comes down to putting things on hold for our patron. So um, one area, and that's for AV parts, you know, because there's kind of three different categories for parts in Missouri Evergreen. So um, AV parts, we... It's for holds and things like that. We always want to use, and, and we have the unified parts here, the common language. And um, here we use, um, you know, disc one through four or, or a complete set is the one that a lot of us are going to use or just disc one, just disc two. Those are what the parts look like. And then our patrons and our staff that are helping patrons can pick the correct um, item that they want for their patrons. And remember that um, if you put a part in there, say you put a part that said complete set, but you had a lowercase s and there was already one in there for and that has an uppercase s, that's another part. That's another thing that the patron has to go through to pick, to put a hold on something. So um, we have unified parts. We have all matching parts for a reason. Our ultimate goal, as always, is, is for our patrons to get what they want. Now, I'm going to throw us into the fire here, and we're going to talk about magazine parts. Okay. Now, National Geographic, as we know, I mean, we have 
over 100 years of National Geographic. Okay, so this this one was an easy one to pick on because um, it's very, you know, there's tons and tons of them. So, but when we bring up a bib, when we do a, a search, of course, the ultimate goal is for one record to come up, you know. Now, can that happen for National Geographic? Maybe not because there are so many um, that, you know, some libraries have, like you'll see here, uh, blocked it off, like this is 10 years, 10 years, you know. Um, I'm not saying that that was wrong. We, it was probably something that we should have discussed as a cataloging community, Missouri Evergreen cataloging community. But I can see why in a situation like this, they would do that because as we know in Missouri Evergreen, when an item has you know, hundreds of holdings, then it that bogs down that bid record, you know. So, um, but what we don't want is we don't want um, oh, I know what I did. I need to do this. Let's see, serials and magazines. Okay, so we have 540 results <laughs> for um, a magazine bib record for National Geographic. So even if we separated them out in 10 year blocks, in 100 year blocks, um, there should be way less than 540. So as you can see, there are several here that are out on their own. Um, and um, we want them all to come together. And we want them to come together with the correct parts as well, because as you'll see here uh, on this bib record, these have parts, some do, some don't. And as you can see, they're, there's 60 items nearly on this bib record, um, but there are common language for magazine parts. Now, when magazines can get complicated, you know, they can be issued, you know, differently for each uh, publication or whatever, you know, but generally speaking, the things we want are for the patrons and staff to understand what they're putting the hold on you know, for National Geographic, this is obviously 2019, the first edition, the first publication in 2019. That, you know, your patron's going to understand that. Um, and as you can see here, when we go to monograph parts, um, let's see, this has all of these parts, and these are parts that have been used. So, talking about parts here, but I'm also talking about adding your items to existing bib records because um, a new issue, certainly one new single issue does not warrant a new bib record. It warrants a new holding on the existing bib record. A new year of a publication does not warrant a new bib record. Um, we should not have, let's see, um, So, hmm. see how there's a new year for every one of these? We shouldn't be doing that. They should all be added to this one bib record with the correct parts. Um, I can see the, the feeling that you, you want to put that new bib record in for the new year, but um, that's not how we need to catalog magazines in Missouri Evergreen. Um, when a patron searches for good housekeeping and they have 50 results, that's not helpful to them. So um, putting all of our magazines together and then using the correct parts is ultimately going to be what helps our patrons. Liz, do you have anything to add? Just that magazines are the worst of the worst serials. Um, so they're, let's be realistic, they're never going to be perfectly clean for anyone ever. Should they be better than 500 results? Yes. Like how Capster had three or four. 
that would be a goal, guys, if everyone just had three or four results per magazine. Um, and is that correct? No, but not having 500 is the goal. Um, so yeah, if you have any individual questions on this and need to like really talk to somebody, you can contact Caterai and we can talk you through it because serials cataloging is a whole thing and yeah. considered sometimes a whole separate profession than just catalogers. They look for serials catalogers. So there's a lot going on behind there that we could explain and help out with if you need it. So if it's still confusing, it's not you, it's serials and you can ask us. Yeah, it can be very confusing, but we have tried to simplify it for Missouri Evergreen that, you know, we have uh, hopefully a main bib record that for that magazine and then the individuality comes with those specific holdings and the parts that we put on it for our patrons. And then um, less used, um, less common is parts for uh, print material. This is normally for, say, encyclopedias or your stamp books or something like that. Um, we do have common language for, for those as well. So uh, this document, as always, is, nope, that's the wrong E, is on our website, Missouri Evergreen's website, member resources, cataloging, training materials, and uh, common language for parts. Questions about parts, serials, subject headings, genres, anything that we talked about today or anything else. All right, guys, I'm so glad that you came this month. Um, we do have our cat help. Okay, Lori, she's got a question. Awesome. I didn't think all parts was available anymore. I thought that complete set had replaced it. Is all parts still an option? You are correct. All parts is not an option. It should be complete set. And um, if you see all parts, what you will do is you will put that complete part monograph part in, and then you will merge all parts and complete set, making complete set your lead. And then it will do all the work and change everything to all from all parts to complete set. You are correct, Lori. All parts is not a um, Missouri Evergreen you know, designated part. Okay, guys. As always, if you need help, uh, all the email addresses will all be in the minutes, but uh, the cataloging committee is at cat, cat help at moevergreenlibraries.org and Liz is cataloger at missourievergreen.org, missourievergreenlibraries.org, I'm sorry. Um, and email us with questions and we will see you. Oh, we got one more question right under the wire. What about Blu-ray DVD combos? Do those need to get broken out into individual parts? Oh, this is a whole bee's nest. <laughs> um, so Abby, um, if you are circling them uh, together, so you have a Blu-ray a, co a combo and you're circling them together, then um, that would be complete set. If you're circling them separately, they need to be on separate bib records then. Um, like my library, and it's very common for Missouri Evergreen Libraries, they buy that combo pack because it's cheaper, but then we separate those out and um, because we're not going to circ them together. And so the DVD gets its own bib record and the Blu-ray gets its own bib record. And um, the, w where it gets complicated, I know, is that the, the numbers aren't going to match necessarily what that original single Blu-ray and or DVD is, but um, the item matches that single DVD record. So I'm gonna put my single DVD on that record and circuit on its own. But if you do keep those um, Blu-ray and DVD combos together and you circulate them together, then you would still need to have a part on there that says complete set. And that's the only, um, really that's the only thing that would make sense for a bib record like that is complete set because if you're doing something different, then it needs to be on separate records. Okay, I'm gonna wait 10 seconds to see if I have any more under the wire questions. These have been excellent questions that we've gotten today. 
Um, next meeting is, Liz, can you get there before I do? February 13th at 11. February 13th at 11. Awesome. And uh, we will see you there. Thanks, everybody.